Hi, my name is Laura Tamlin Watts, and I'm the president and CEO of CanAge, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. It's a pleasure to welcome you today to this session looking at restoring trust, COVID-19 and the future of long-term care. This extraordinary report was the hard work of the Royal Society of Canada. And when it came out in April, 2020, it really changed the conversation that we were having to have the Royal Society come forward with their expertise and be able to both talk very specifically about some of the issues on long-term care generally, and then focus them on what was happening with the guidance of COVID-19 was critically important. I would like to acknowledge also so many of the other organizations that were involved in this, including the Canadian Frailty Network and other networks that were integral in supporting the conversations about long-term care. At our organization, CanAge, we have just released the Voices of Canada's Seniors, a roadmap to an age-inclusive Canada. And I can tell you that that large policy framework really used the great resources of restoring trust, COVID-19, and the future of long-term care that was developed by the Royal Society. So as you go forward, I hope that you will have the opportunity to use the information that you learned today and engage with that report and the work that is available online. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me or the Canadian Frailty Network or the Royal Society with any questions that you may have. Thanks very much and enjoy the information and session today. April 8th, the president of the Royal Society of Canada uh, established uh, this task force, this task force on COVID-19, uh, with the mandate to provide uh, informed perspectives on, on how to deal, not just with the crisis now, but also going, going forward. Tom Mary was appointed the, the chair uh, of, of this committee. And, and it is populated by you know, wonderful scholars, a diverse group of scholars from all across, across Canada. Also in April, uh, the Royal Society partnered with, with the Globe and Mail on a really unique initiative, I think, uh, called uh, Zero Canada Project. And, and it tries to draw together the strengths uh, of, of, of the, the Globe and Mail with the Royal Society uh, to to inform uh, Canadians, policymakers, healthcare providers uh, on, on this crisis, you know, to really try to empower this country to move, move forward. We already have, I think it's over 30 perspectives on the Royal Society uh, webpage. So I encourage everyone to go there, check those out. And, and I think we have over 30 in the pipeline now. So, you know, a really, really exciting initiative. And again, I invite everyone to check that out on the website. Okay, today's discussion results from the leadership of Sharon Strauss and Carol Esterbrooks. Uh, as, a, as a member of the task force, Sharon coordinated the establishment uh, of a working group on, on long-term care, a really important topic. Uh, and the working group was uh, chaired by Carol and, and Janice Keith from Mount St. Vincent University was a member of the working group and our third panelist today. So, so what we're gonna do today, we got kind of four, four sections. <laughs> Uh, the first section, Sharon's going to give you uh, an overview of the project, you know, what, what the process was. Uh, and, then, and then Carol's going to give you a summary uh, of the report and some of the recommendations. And then we're going to hear from Janice, and she's going to supplement that, that information with some key recommendations, you know, uh, for uh, give us information on, on agenda going forward. What we need to do, what are the action points? Uh, I will then ask the panelists. Uh, just just a couple of uh, questions to get the ball rolling. Some key some key questions, and, and then we're going to get to your your questions, which I think is so important. We we do want to hear from everyone, uh, as many people as we can. We'll, we might aggregate some of the uh, of the questions that are being uh, being asked, but but we'll we'll get to get to your questions next. Uh, and really really looking forward to that. So so let's get started. I'm really excited about this. Uh, I'm going to turn it over. To you, Sharon. Let's uh, let's go for it. Great. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks everybody for spending some time with us today. 
So we're gonna address the report that, uh, that we created. And first of all, before I start, I wanted to acknowledge the land on which we're really fortunate to be able to work. And we recognize that the territory has a long history and that it really does um, reflect the, the people whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory. We also wanted to recognize that those of us who are on the working group and that we're gonna be talking about, we represent people who live from, from coast to coast in Canada and um, we, we are able to work on land that belong to, to many others. So for example, I'm based in Toronto and this land belonged to and was lived on by the Mississaugas, the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee amongst others. We also want to acknowledge that the meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island and we're really grateful to, to have the opportunity to work on the land. And we also recognize that we have a responsibility to care for the land on which we, we live and work. We also wanted to acknowledge that we're tremendously committed to recognize, honor, and take action on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry Calls for Action. Next slide, please. So as Tim said, this, this working group came about from the, the task force, and I really wanted to acknowledge the, the members of the working group, some of whom are also uh, on the call today, and in addition wanted to thank them all for their tremendously hard work. This was done, as Tim said, under the leadership of the amazing Dr. Carol Esther Books, who put a tremendous amount of time and energy into developing this report. Wanted to also thank our peer reviewers. We had a tremendously tight timeline on this report and we thank our peer reviewers who are listed here, who provided us with a huge amount of very thoughtful feedback on a really, really tight timeline. And we in particular wanted to thank Naomi Black, who is a resident of a long-term care home, and her feedback was hugely helpful to us. I also wanted to acknowledge the residents of the long-term care settings and their families and caregivers. Also wanting to, to acknowledge the long-term care staff who have worked tirelessly over the last few months during the pandemic. In particular, wanted to thank all of those in the long-term care settings the PSWs in particular who provide, as we know, 90% of the, the direct care, and all of those in the hospital who provide the indirect care, who often we don't hear about and wanted to thank them. And finally, we wanted to acknowledge the residents and the long-term care staff who died during COVID, and we really wanted to honor their memory. Next slide, please. So our approach was very much focused on using the evidence to inform the report. And we wanted to look at the research context as well as the policy environment in long-term care in Canada before COVID, but also looking at what were the things that happened during COVID that precipitated uh, what we saw and what we saw play out across, across Canada. So evidence very much was the foundation of, of the report. And we used it to outline the challenges in long-term care but also to identify specific recommendations. And one of the things that, that we wanted to highlight is that this report really focuses on things that need to be done urgently. So it's not thinking about what needs to be done five years from now, 10 years from now, but we wanted to focus on things for immediate action. We also recognize that we're not addressing in this report everything that's relevant to long-term care. So it's not gonna address all the issues such as what the buildings should look like in the future, this is really focused in a specific area. We also acknowledge that it doesn't address Indigenous people living in long-term care, and we hope that that's something that will get looked at in the future because we think it's critically important. We do acknowledge that we wanted to use an intersectionality lens when we were thinking about long-term care and also thinking about how the recommendations should be implemented. And by intersectionality, we mean that as we all know, as human beings, we are made up of a bunch of different characteristics. So for example, we can think about age and sex and gender and language and, um, and socioeconomic status and religion. And who we are is the intersection of all those factors. And when we're thinking about long-term care, the residents, the workforce, the recommendations that, that we're suggesting, it really has to take an intersectionality approach and think about it from, from that perspective. And now more than ever with what's going on in the world, what we've seen unfold during COVID, 
what we've seen in terms of the, the health disparities and inequities that are highlighted during this period even further, it really underscores the need to take an intersectionality approach to this. So today we're not gonna review absolutely everything that was in the report. It's a very long document with huge appendices and I would encourage all of you who are interested to have a look at that. And instead we're gonna focus on some specific aspects and then we'll invite some, some discussion and conversation with all of you. And now I'm just gonna hand it over to the amazing Carol Esther Brooks. All right, thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, if I could have the first slide or the next slide. Uh, so I'm going to talk very, very briefly about findings. We had a lot of things that we reported on and we can't address everything today. Before I do that, I want to acknowledge, and I've seen some of the folks entering the webinar, and I know that some of you are running homes that may, you may not see reflected in what we're going to talk about. There are examples of splendid um, exemplary care in this country, some of them in my own province and some in every province. And we know that, um, but that is not what the focus of the report was. So I just want to acknowledge that before I start so that you don't feel like I'm painting everything with a really bleak brush because the, the report is hard to read. There are some really bleak findings in it. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, it's important, I think, to note that nursing homes didn't uh, grow up alongside of hospitals and weren't really, didn't emerge from the healthcare system. They're rooted in 17th century Elizabethan poor law. And those roots still have tags that we see uh, today in different parts of the country. So they were, their origins are in the almshouses or poor houses where we house the destitute and the poor and those with no place to go and no one to help care for them. So they weren't very positive places in their very origins. Next slide. It does highlight though the need for social care in, in nursing homes, not just health care. So as we've all heard and we've all learned, vulnerability is COVID-19's ally. Um, the highly vulnerable and those with intersecting vulnerabilities as Sharon's identified really have borne the brunt of the damages of COVID-19, not just in nursing homes, but particularly in nursing homes. We also see the same sort of tragedy playing out in homeless shelters, in prisons, and in other settings where people with the, these degrees of vulnerability tend to reside. Next slide, please. So our findings were shaped by five decades of reports that we looked at commissions, commissions of inquiries, public inquiries, private inquiries, reports and task force and committees. So we scanned over 150 reports in the last five decades. And we also scanned 10 years of media uh, reporting on usually very negative things, often scandalous uh, events that had happened in nursing homes, untold studies, uh, research studies, and what we saw uh, was an unfailing repetition of findings. Next slide, please. And this is directly from the report. So concerns about quality of care and safety have persisted despite the recommendations of each report. The tragic events have continued, the inequities have deepened and the root ca causes or issues really haven't been challenged. And the result has been the unnecessary and needless suffering of older adults and most unfortunately, or equally as unfortunately, uh, an exacerbating of the fear that many Canadians already had at the prospect that they might themselves need a nursing home at some point in their lives. A recent study in the US reported that 50% of Americans would rather die than go to a nursing home. So that fear is sometimes rooted in reality and sometimes it's rooted in, in fear of the unknown or things that you don't understand. But it shouldn't be that way in uh, the developed world and certainly not in a high income, high quality of life country like ours. Next slide. So that repetition of findings as, and that failure to really address the root causes really has influenced us quite significantly. Uh, we've heard and we'll repeat it that COVID-19 did not break the long-term care sector. It did show us how deep the long-standing systemic problems are internationally and in Canada. And most tragically, um, Canada has emerged as the country with the poorest performance internationally 
in terms of the number of deaths in long-term care homes or nursing homes. So out of the total COVID deaths in Canada, 81% have been in nursing homes. Um, some of those, most of those deaths have been due directly to COVID and some have been from starvation and dehydration. Next slide, please. So there are many root causes and we won't talk about all of them today. I'll just highlight a couple here that I'm not going to talk about on the next few slides. Um, COVID-19 and long-term care itself has a disproportionate impact on women. 90% of the paid frontline workforce are women. 75% of the unpaid family friend workforce are women. Uh, two thirds of people with dementia are women and two thirds of people in nursing homes are women. So there's a very high impact on women. So issues related to how women manage in society, uh, manage the, their place in the workforce, manage their caregiving responsibilities, et cetera, are, are particularly important here. Um, also, one of the root causes has been that there's a clear, there are clear indications and clear evidence that we haven't valued caregiving, by which I mean we haven't remunerated people. That's one way we haven't valued caregiving. And that's all tangled up in the disproportionate impact on women. We also have a very hard time seeing ourselves as old or potentially getting dementia and approaching death. Our death aversion really plays actively into some of the ways we've managed and not managed long-term care. At the end of the day, we've created a kind of out of sight, out of mind silencing of older adults with extreme um, vulnerabilities, um, particularly with dementia in nursing homes. I don't, none of us believe that any group or any individual has ever intentionally wanted anything bad to happen. But I think that what's happening in Canada and elsewhere is a reflection of what happens when we neglect and don't pay attention to what's going on. And, and it's important that we don't assume that everything's okay just because nothing is in our particular circle. Next slide, please. So COVID was unique in some ways. It was novel, so there wasn't any collective immunity. Um, it's highly infectious, much more infectious than influenza with a long incubation period. And we don't, of course, have an effective treatment or prevention at this stage. So you drop that kind of a um, contagious disease into a population of older adults, 70% of whom have dementia, at least 70%, and therefore severe communication and comprehension difficulties. They have less effective immune systems and they present often with atypical symptoms. And you get this recipe that you've seen in the media, you've seen talked about in terms of a a perfect storm or a potential for a raging wildfire. People have used all sorts of metaphors. So that was COVID's uniqueness. But most other things about what it did have to do with these long-standing issues. Next slide, please. So funding's been inadequate. Um, I don't think there's anybody um, in the country that would disagree with that. It's just clearly we haven't paid enough attention. Um, there have been uh, ongoing federal provincial jurisdictional issues. Uh, we all know that health and long-term care generally is a provincial jurisdictional issue, but we also know that in health, um, there has been, um, we do have the Canada Health Act, but there's no similar framework for long-term care. Um, the Canada Health Act is about health. Um, we believe that a national framework for long-term care has to be about health and social care because it's not just about health. Uh, there's a perversity of regulation in long-term care. So it's really super over-regulated in some areas and highly risk averse and then really under or not regulated in others and everything in between. And generally, there's been a failure, not so much by the operators or the of homes and the managers and directors of care, but by the system more broadly to view a nursing home as a home. It's where you go. It's like moving from your home to a condo and now you're moving from your condo to the next home. So it shouldn't be structured like a chronic hospital. Um, and in many places it isn't, but we still see vestiges of that. Next slide. Please. So many of the longstanding issues, the buildings are old. Um, the congregate settings um, are 
Um, there are many of them, and many of these older buildings have two or more residents in a room. We have a lack of integration with the acute care system and other parts of the continuing care system, and this has been particularly problematic. There's an appalling lack of data with which to manage the long-term care system, and an equally appalling lack of a, an ecosystem or a, a system of any kind that's been built to act on that data and support managers and directors and other people at the coal face to actually use that data to <clears throat> make positive change. Next slide. Um, we spent a lot of time focusing on the issues on this slide. Um, we declared early in the report that if we do nothing else, if nothing else is done by any government or any group in this country, we have to address the workforce issues. Um, we have seen trends to fewer regulated staff um, registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, etc. We've talked about how the direct workforce is, um, not, gives 90% of the care. They're poorly trained. They're older, poorly paid, racialized women, of whom as many as a third were working more than one job prior to COVID to make a living. So the salaries range from $12 to $24. I mean, this is not a well remunerated um, sector. Um, and they are caring for an increasingly socially and medically complex population of older adults. These are the oldest old, with um, most of them with some form of cognitive impairment, usually a dementia, with multiple conditions, high levels of dependency, and they come later to nursing homes because we are doing better at supporting people in the community and at home. So they have shorter lengths of stay and they're closer to death, which means that we need really strong palliative approaches to care, which aren't always present. Because not do you, ought you to be able to live a good end of your life, you ought to be able to have a good death. Next slide, please. So I'll just end with this. Uh, at the core of it, it's an issue of values. And what do you get to expect in Canada when you get old and infirm? Um, Put another way, what's the value of a life that's been lived? And until we begin to address those really core issues, we'll probably be unable to move ahead on some of the root causes. It will cost money, that's clear. But right now, because the data um, is so poorly available and poorly collected in Canada, it's difficult to even price the recommendations that we and others have been making. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Janice Keith, my colleague in what I hope is sunny Halifax. <laughs> Actually, I'm in sunny Prince Edward Island today. Well, the today. <laughs> um, as you can see from Carol's presentation, we have a lot to do. Um, uh, and as Carol had mentioned, our committee really talked about how this report could make a difference in the multitude of reports that have already existed over the past decade, knowing things need to be fixed. So we decided early on, as Carol mentioned, to focus on solving the workforce crisis. Next slide, please. This can't be done alone. This can't be done within provinces without federal government funding. So with new federal funding, what we're calling for is appropriate pay and benefits, including sick leave, not just for the COVID crisis, but permanently for those under -regul unregulated workers, the care aides and the personal care workers. And we need this to be equitable across Canada in the long-term care sector and between acute care and long-term care. And that's for unregulated workers as well as the regulated workers. That is number one must be done. We also know that full-time employment must be made available to the staff, um, for all the staff, so that people are not in the position where they are working multiple places. And we, we need to evaluate this one, one home policy that's put in place right now in many different provinces, but we need to see what impact that has on adequate staffing for other aspects of the continuum of care, be it hospitals, retirement homes, um, or um, assisted living facilities or home care. Minimum standards, educational standards for the unregulated workers, the care aides, personal care workers, 
whatever you call them in, in your province, because every province is different, we need some minimum educational standards. In addition, we do need continuing education for all the staff, both in terms of infection control, dementia, a whole host of other things. As well, we need proper training and orientation for other temporary staff that the nursing homes may be contracting out from private agencies. We know that the pandemic has made an incredible uh, stressor on our staff in long-term care facilities. And so we're calling for uh, the provision of mental health support for that staff. It's going to be uh, long-term uh, consequences in the area of mental health for these individuals. They've experienced uh, unimaginable uh, loss of people they've cared for for many years, as well as grief. And so we need to make sure uh, we know that this is happening because of our previous experience with SARS, with some early reports out of China, as well as uh, other reviews, that we need to make sure that we address this issue. Next slide, please. In addition, um, we are calling on the federal government to immediately commission and act on a comprehensive pan-Canadian assessment of national standards for staffing and staffing mix in nursing homes. We know that, a, as Carol had mentioned, the staff in nursing homes, 90% of it are those frontline uh, care aides, but there's a whole host of other uh, professionals who are involved, be they uh, nurses, RNs, LPNs, um, uh, allied health professionals, and so on. We also need national standards for nursing homes to make sure that there is training and resources for infection control, um, including appropriate uh, ways of utilizing uh, personal protective equipment. And we also need to have better protocols for expanding staff when it's needed during a crisis, as well as the issues around access uh, for family members and family caregivers and the protocols around restricting them. We can't get money from the federal government without understanding the impact that it's had. So we need to be able to measure outcomes. That funding needs to be accountable. And this is critical. Uh, we need to have data collected to monitor the residents' quality of care and their quality of life. Because most residents, that's what they want, is a quality of life, and that's what they deserve. We need to monitor the family and the residents' experiences, and don't forget the quality of the work life for the staff. Because when the staff have a good quality of work life, the resident will be more likely to have a good quality of life. We also need uh, the provinces and territories to collect data at arm's length from the long-term care sector. Data that's evidence-based and, and balanced in its approach to accreditation, to regulation, and to inspection. And I should say when we're measuring those outcomes, we also, right now, as, as was spoken about by both Carol and Sharon, we need to have better data to understand the multiple uh, compounding vulnerabilities of residents and their families. So we need to understand uh, factors such as culture and religion and language, um, uh, LGBTQ2S, individuals. So there's a whole host of other uh, uh, vulnerabilities that we need to understand and assess um, in this data collection. Next slide, please. So what, if our, what are our next steps? Well, Sharon and Carol, together with uh, one of our colleagues uh, on, our, on our working group, Car uh, Colleen Flood, wrote an op-ed in The Globe in early June about immediate steps. 
what we need to do to prepare for the second wave. We did that early on. They did that because we needed to get ahead of the second wave. And so they made some very specific uh, recommendations for things that should be happening right now this summer. So all nursing homes should have prepared plans for infection control and we should have oversight in place so that we can see that that is being opera operationalized uh, if an outbreak occurs. We need to have a plan for isolating residents who are tested positive, be that on site or be it off site if there isn't sufficient room in the facilities to isolate them. We need to ensure that we're uh, procuring the appropriate protective equipment and that individuals are trained in how to use it and how to dispose of it. And very near and dear to my heart, we need to enable family and friends to have meaningful contact to give care to the residents. These are in particular family caregivers who've been providing an enormous amount of support for both the resident, but also for the staff in the facility and have been cut out. We also need from our report for our next steps to immediately have the federal government commission and act on those national standards for staffing and staff mix that we've proposed as well the all levels of government, the federal, provincial and territorials need to act on the recommendations that we proposed to solve the workforce crisis that I mentioned at the beginning. You know, we deliberately called this report restoring trust, the future of long term care. And that's because we have the capacity, we have the knowledge and we have the resources to take immediate steps towards restoring that trust that we have broken. And that's what this report is essentially all about, restoring trust. Over to you, Tim. Well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those excellent, excellent presentations. Uh, we have lots of really, really good questions. Uh, I, I'm gonna start with a broad one really for, for everyone. Um, and perhaps, perhaps start with you, Carol. Uh, you mentioned the idea of how we think about death um, being uh, really one of the underlying drivers. And, and this ties into one of the questions we got from, from a viewer about, about ageism. So, so could you talk a little bit more about, about the role of how Canadians and really in our society, we think about death and, and, and ageism and how that plays into this, into the situation that we have now uh, and perhaps more, a more complex question is, do you have any suggestions on what we can do about that? I'm so glad you started off with a really easy question, Tim. <laughs> uh, the, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, to this panel and to most people who look at this sector that ageism plays a, a key role. Our attitudes, our core attitudes about the old and the very old, have let us let this happen. And especially during COVID, and we're starting to hear it in the, in the Southern United States, just as we heard it in Europe, people are beginning to talk about rationing or where we're out of ICU beds and we're out of ventilators. And so how will we ration? Everybody can't be treated properly. And age is often indiscriminately used um, as a, a rationing um, criterion. And we really need to reevaluate that. Um, there have to be criteria if we have to ration, but just blindly saying age is not necessarily appropriate. Um, I really think it comes down to the value we place on a life that's been lived. Uh, um, and in nursing homes, these folks, they're old. Um, they're not part of the economic engine anymore. They're probably not voting. Um, they may have wealth, but if they have got wealth, uh, you know, the children may be managing and that wealth and so they aren't able to inject that wealth into the country so that creates a, a situation where the value I think has diminished um, and in our culture we also have some societal trends we, we aren't we're quite mobile the fertility rates down there are reports out of the Ryerson group that we're going to have 30% fewer caregivers um, in a couple of decades 
So we haven't really nurtured this idea of intergenerational living. So yes, it's a factor. How do we fix it? I don't know, but I know some things that we can do. We can begin to look at, for example, in nursing homes, how do we create intergenerational experiences? It's, it's like not normal to only be with your little tiny age bracket. If you go into a nursing home and talk to old people, it's not uncommon to hear them say, if they're able to communicate with you, oh, everybody here is so old. And that isn't necessarily meaning that they've lost their ability to comprehend. It's just not normal to only be around old people. So there are some programs in Canada and elsewhere. We need to really think about those, but we need to think about intergenerational living in the community as well. It shouldn't just be for <clears throat> a program we put into a nursing home. And we need to do things in the schools. I talked before the pandemic hit to a group, I was terrified, but I talked to a group of elementary school kids about, they wanted me to talk about research nursing homes. And I thought, oh my goodness. But it was actually really heartening um, to hear them ask questions and talk about old people with a kind of reverence. So I think it's there when they're little, we do something as we age, to kind of make it go away. But I think there are things we can do. They're not easy solutions, um, but I think the first thing we can do is start to say, why is it that we think it's okay to just have old people in nursing homes? Like, then I'll stop. There's a really great program in Great Britain where they have a young colleague that's living for really, really modest, modest rents with older adults in the community so that they both, uh, the student gets really uh, manageable rent and the older adult gets somebody with them somebody to talk to, somebody to help out a bit. So there are different kinds of programs that different countries are trying. Excellent. I've heard about that program, really, really innovative. Uh, so, so my next question, I'm going to try to tie together, you know, something that we've talked about on the, on the panel um, and uh, ties in a couple, a couple of questions that we've received. Um, from a framework perspective, are, do you see the provincial governments needing to take, to take charge uh, given that so much so much of this is private, privately funded, you know, how are we going to, without some kind of provincial oversight, how are we going to change this, the workforce challenge? And um, bundling in this into another tough question for everyone, the federal government, what's the role? Sharon, do you want to take a shot? Sure. So, so I'll start off and then Janice and Carol can, can jump in afterwards. I mean, I think it really does have to come down to better collaboration and coordination between the federal and the provincial and territorial governments. And, and I know a lot of times people are saying, oh, well, it's up to the provinces and territories to fix this because that's where healthcare happens. But in fact, the federal government really does um, have to play a role as well. And in particular, you know, they should be the, the ones that are stepping up around, um, you know, as, as mentioned by Janice and Carol, to, um, to commission the, the national standards and to, um, to support it from a funding perspective and to make the provinces accountable and to make us accountable to the funding that's received. I also think it's important to highlight that in countries, uh, so Carol mentioned that Canada has one of the highest um, percentages of, of older people in, in the long-term care settings who died from COVID when you look around the world. And if you look at the latest OECD report, and you see which countries did better. The countries that did better were ones where there really is an integrated system. And so where acute care and long-term care were integrated and where the federal and, um, and the more local policy making were integrated. And so for example, the ones that had the, the lowest um, mortality rates in the long-term care settings were Australia, Austria, and Slovenia because at the onset, they implemented policies that address the long-term care, the acute care, as well as from a public health perspective. So they did it all at the same time, rather than you know, what we saw in Canada, where we actually performed in you know, one of the worst countries, because we did this in this very fragmented way, and that you know, it wasn't really about the partnerships between the federal and the, and the provincial and territorial governments. And so then that was why we saw this disconnect. So I think it highlights further that we really do need to see this partnership and better coordination. Janice, do you agree with yeah, that? I, I totally agree with that. I think that uh, we have to recognize that the provinces and territories have the expertise. They have, they've been managing the long-term care. But what we found was there was a lot of emphasis and, and dollars and preparation that went in to acute care and very little in long-term care. So long-term care 
we know, we've always said they are the poor second cousin or Cinderella of the system. Um, but, you know, they are as valuable. They're an integral part of our health system, our continuing care system. So why are we not giving more attention to that? And, you know, I understand that there are jurisdictional issues. However, uh, they, I think given that 80% of our deaths died in long-term care, surely we can get over the squabbling between provinces and the federal government. It, at the very least for, for the older people who helped to build the country in the first place. So, I, I mean, I guess I don't buy that they're just gonna squabble because I think everybody wants the best outcome. Yeah, excellent point. And, and I'm gonna jump to our, our very last, one of the last questions that we got on our feed. Um, because uh, it ties in with this so well. And Carol, I'm going to put this to you. <laughs> um, do you think we should amend the Canada Health Act? Do you think we should amend that and, and try to draw this all together? I'm, I'm, I'm dumping all these hard ones on you, Carol. Well, let me just jump right into the Canada Health Act. Um, I don't, and I don't think we believe that the Canada Health Act should be open uh, to fix this. However, it's a good exemplar. The Canada Health Act is about health, and long-term care is about health and social care whether we like it or not, uh, and social care, if health care is being done well, social care is actually the more important one, but you've got to have the health being done well, then Canada Health Act provides a framework, a national framework. It may be fraught, and we may have different opinions about it, but it ensures some things for Canadians, like portability um, and accessibility, which aren't there for older Canadians needing long-term care. So we think there should be a national framework tailored to the long-term care sector so that it can create the kind of pillars that we have in the Canada Health Act that are particularly relevant to long-term care. Now, they can't, I mean, the worst thing we could do, I suppose, is to build them separately because they are integrated because one of the challenges we saw in the, um, in the, and are seeing in the COVID crisis is, for example, hospitals and nursing homes, that isn't integrated, and assisted living is integrated with nursing homes and hospitals and retirement homes, et cetera. So it has to be done in an integrated fashion. But when people say, oh, we can't do this, it's a provincial jurisdiction, we've already do it with the Canada Health Act. It may not be perfect, but it is a model that we could look at, and we know that the federal government's primary lever is uh, transfer payments, uh, and we believe there will need to be transfer payments to address this, but the transfer payments, as Janice said, shouldn't occur without proper accountabilities. Um, you know, you already see posturing and, and things going on between the feds and, and the provinces. Uh, I would just ask or submit the position that, or question that do we think that anybody who died in their own excrement in a nursing home was worried about jurisdictional squabbles. Yeah, powerful point. Um, uh, I'm gonna jump to uh, a th the theme of data. You know, again, this is something that emerged uh, throughout the report and, and it's probably a theme that a lot of people don't necessarily think about when they think about the long-term care uh, crisis, but it's a, it's, a really, it's a really important point. So a couple of the questions ask, you know, uh, how do you envision this data uh, of being collected? Where is it coming from? Do you see Kai High getting involved? Uh, so perhaps speak a little bit more about the importance of the data and how you see, see that being collected. What changes would you like to see? Because I, I do think it's an important point that's often missed. So let me jump in first and let the others join. We have one system in place in Canada, not everywhere though, in some jurisdictions, where we do a reasonable job of measuring quality of care. We do functional and clinical outcomes with a routine system that's in place, but it's not everywhere. There isn't an accompanying system on how to act on it and a lot of much support for how to really act on it. We don't really do adequate longitudinal over time trending with it, but it's there. So we have a model, um, but we don't have any data in Canada. There is no routine data collection on quality of life for people with moderate to severe dementia. Um, and if you can't measure something, you can't manage it. Like, how do you know what your quality of life is? And how do you know if it's getting better? And how do you know in your organization if this program you put in place has really lifted it, et cetera, et cetera. We have no data and on the workforce unless it happens in individual research studies or programs. 
uh, on their physical health, their mental health, their work engagement, their levels of burnout, their risk for burnout, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have particularly good or, or consistent data about family or resident experiences. We have a lot of work to do there. And that's just without breaking a sweat areas where we don't have data and we don't have data that's integrated. Um, so you've got to put the data about residents together with the data about families, together with the data about like quality of life and quality of care and funding and staffing. So who should do it? Well, uh, the federal government has quite a bit of jurisdiction over data, so it certainly can have a role. We have a fine organization in Kaihai. We have a fine organization in Stats Canada. We have health quality councils. So there are ways that we could put together a national strategy that wasn't piecemeal, that was integrated. I don't know, Janice and Sharon, if you have other perspectives on that. I'm pretty passionate about data because like, it's like using, as we said in the report, a Ouija board, if you don't yeah. have data to make decisions with. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in and say, without data, it's so difficult to make policy uh, decisions. And just doing an expert panel in long-term care, uh, chairing it in Nova Scotia, kept calling for more staff. But we don't even know which nursing homes in our province of Nova Scotia has higher needs than another nursing home or, or the unit. So having the base data is critically important. But quality of life, I think, is something that's often over, uh, overlooked in terms of, of the residents. And so I'd really echo the need for that. And also the need to understand some of those compounding vulnerabilities that we talked about. Mm. The fact that, you know, we have no information on race, uh, you know, ethnicity, religion of, of residents in long-term care or their families. We don't collect that data, so we don't know what are those com confounding vulnerabilities that may be impacting on the residents. So I do think there, there is a need. There's, there's a, as Carol's mentioned, I won't repeat it, there's a lot of um, resources and expertise out there. We just have to work better together and integrate, I think, um, because we also need to attract researchers to this field as well, and that was in the report, the whole specialization of long-term care. We really need to have a cadre of really dedicated researchers to help to analyze the data when we get it. And just a, just a couple of other things around, around the data. Clearly we're all passionate about the data because <laughs> the data drives the change. Um, but, uh, but a couple of other things is that in addition to Janice mentioning about you know, wanting to know these intersecting categories for their residents, it's also for the staff, the long-term care workforce as well. And so we really need to have a better understanding of the workforce so that they can be optimally supported. And then the other thing to mention, you know, again, the report really focused on, on the, the long-term care home setting, but we also have to think about there's retirement homes and, um, and there's, there's virtually, you know, even less data available on retirement homes. And yet we saw outbreaks in those settings as well. And so we really need to address that. So we can't ignore those other settings. Um, and I think that's why, again, why we, we really are very passionate about making sure that there is that, that data um, using valid measures. And then that's gonna be accessible to people to be able to really use to drive the change. Um, the workforce thing is is a really good point, and, and you can see in the report that you guys see this as central, right? You know, you got the data issue, and you got this workforce issue. So, uh, Janice, this this is for you, real quickly, because we're actually starting to run out of time. Um, uh, is we have a lot of questions about the workforce. You know, this this is largely a privately well, not our, largely, but you know, the privately funded is a big part of the equation. It's it's fragmented. Can we fix, how is this gonna happen? Can we really fix it? This is a big problem. What's the one thing you would like to see happen uh, soon? Oh, I think we have to um, provide adequate pay and benefits to the workers. We have to do that. We have to, we have to provide the opportunity for full-time employment. We have to be able to have a stable workforce uh, that are valued for the type of work that they do. And, and, they, and part of that value, I guess I'm going to throw in education because if, you know, you can pay them as much as whatever, but you need, you need them to be properly trained and educated as well. So that would be my one thing. Let's uh, but can, Janice, can we do it with the structure now? Is, gonna, is it going to require a fundamental change in, in 
in the regulatory framework? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's every province is different and this is, you know, we can get bogged down in all of those differences in jurisdictions, but I do think there should be um, some minimum levels. The fact that somebody is doing this kind of work for $12 an hour is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and it's, it's embarrassing, I guess, um, you know, and so I guess I, um, I think there, there must be a way I was thinking about this, what happened when we used to build, you know, houses, and we never had uh, bona fide electricians, right? It's like, how do you get those regulations in place? Surely, there's a way uh, that happened in so many different sectors. Um, we can get that to happen in this sector as well. And just to, just to build on that, Tim, is that we've got good examples across the country where during COVID that happened. So in BC, for example, um, you know, in, in, was it, in April, um, they mandated that all the, the, um, the workers would be public employees and therefore subject to, um, you know, the, the adequate pay and, and benefits. And so that was in place, that's going to be in place for six months. And so the challenge now is to see that getting sustained. And many other provinces put in pandemic pay and things, you know, to top people up. Um, but they had, you know, they've got a stop date on. And so, we, you know, we're advocating for looking at that to continue. Yeah, let me jump in too, Tim. Um, this is a place where regulation can be. Um, there's a lot of controversy and a lot of variation about, well, you know, private for profit, public not for profit, voluntary, et cetera. But here in Alberta, one of the things they've done quite reasonably successfully with regulation is manage the amount of direct hours so that private operators um, have, have to provide a certain number of direct hours to get their funding envelope. So it's a place where provinces can step up to the plate and regulate the industry um, with respect to staffing. Um, and I think that, um, and, and there's a lot of variation across the country, but it seems to me that coming together and discussing things that are working well and looking at promising practices as well as where there have been problems is one of the early steps that we could do because there's quite a bit of siloing across the country in this regard. Um, we're really running out of time here. So I have one last question. I think it's an important topic that I, I want to touch on. Just get some brief comments. And that's the gender issue. I mean, it's really stark. You know, when you guys laid that out for you, and I thought I was aware of these issues and I was, you know, pretty, it's, it's pretty uh, um, uh, important uh, to recognize uh, this reality. So maybe I'll start with you, Carol. Um, what do you want people to take away from this, the, the gender uh, disparity here? And, and do you have any suggestions on how to move forward? Well, there's some early things we can think about that aren't as hard to get your head around. If you're uh, an older racialized woman or maybe a middle-aged racialized woman and you've got two kids and you're working two jobs and maybe have an aging parent, what are we doing in terms of work, the workforce supports to enable you? And then COVID happens and the schools are out and so your kids are home and you don't have any childcare. So you can see how long-term care in the workforce is tied into what we do and don't do around something like universal childcare. Um, pandemic notwithstanding. So I think that's part of it. I think understanding the profound mental and physical health impacts on the unpaid workforce of caregiving, whether it's in the home, in, uh, in assisted living, or in nursing homes, where there's, there's unquestionable evidence that women bear the brunt of that burden and that they have serious physical and mental health impacts and that we lose them from the workforce. And sometimes we lose them from the workforce because if the husband and wife uh, have to decide who's gonna stay home to look after the aging parent, the husband's often making the higher salary. So the woman withdraws from the workforce. So you can see how gender, it just dominoes or sex and gender throughout the system in terms of how it disproportionately affects women. So areas around workforce and child support economic supports and respite for elder care and support for, because just because your mom or your dad or your husband or your wife goes to a nursing home doesn't mean the caregiving burden stops. It shifts in some ways it can become harder. So I think that's where one place we could start. Um, there are a raft of others and we have people on the panel who have substantial depth in this area and done a lot of work in it. 
And I just want to jump jump in and say, you know, it goes back to the undervaluing of women's labor generally. I mean, the the whole reason why um, unpaid caregiving, we call it unpaid, it's not as valued, it's invisible, it's hidden, it's just expected that women do it. And so when they go into the workforce and provide that level of care, personal care, well, that's what women do. And so we don't have to pay them as much. And so there's there's this, un, and, and they shouldn't be asking for more if they go on strike. Look at those horrible women that are leaving our, you know, residents. Anyway, so it's, it's you, you see the issue, it's, 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 as Carol says, there's some economic, there's some supportive policy around childcare, but there's also a fundamental, it's like ageism, sexism. There's a fundamental problem here, people. The work, we, we all work should be valuable. End of story. And just tying it to, Tim, your first question around ageism, if we think about the residents in long-term care, they're more likely to be women. And so then this is an example of the compounding of the ageism and the gender issue. And, um, and I think that's, again, ties back to, that could be why we're seeing a bigger issue because you know, it, it is largely affecting women as being residents in care. Excellent. Well, we, we have so many, so many good questions and, and I, I'm sorry that we can't get to them all. It's because this is such a compelling topic. We have questions about, about MAID, about the use of technology and, and AI uh, we have uh, questions, more questions about, about how we uh, are going to deal with the legislative framework here. Uh, but we don't have time for all of it. <laughs> and I, I think it really highlights the degree to which this is, this is a crucial issue. So, you know, I thank the panel. I thank you guys for your presentation. I thank you guys for the work that you've done on this topic and your scholarship that has led uh, to this work. Um, so thank you very much, and, and please pass on our gratitude to the entire, to the entire working group. Uh, thank you for everyone uh, for listening in. Really, really appreciate your participation. Um, recognize that, that the Royal Society of Canada has a number of working groups uh, on this topic. We have, I think, is it seven we have in, in, in the pipeline? And, and we have one that's coming out in, in the near future on, on mental health that kind of ties in a little bit, but with what we're talking about today, some similar themes. Again, another important topic. Um, I'd also like to thank the whole, a whole gang at Walter House at the Royal Society, you know, hub there, the mothership for, for your excellent work, putting this together. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, uh, follow the Royal Society of Canada on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. So let's stay in touch. Let's keep this conversation going uh, again. Uh, thank you very, very much to everyone uh, for, for your work, for being involved. Uh, please, please keep in touch. Thanks, everyone. Stay well. Thanks, Tim. Thank Great job. Thank you.